Following this massive defeat, little will be left for the forces of the beast other than to exploit this victory. And the beast will invade the lands of the Southern Alliance and inundate them and sweep through them, and he will advance into the beautiful land, that is, Israel. Now many lands will fall before him, but these will escape from his control, Edom and Moab and the first part of the territory of the sons of Ammon, that is, the southern half of historical Ammon, contiguous to Edom and Moab. And Antichrist will extend his control over the lands of the southern alliance, so that even the land of Egypt will not escape. Thus he will take control of all the repositories of gold and silver, even over all of Egypt's treasures, with Libya, that is, representing North Africa, and Cush, that is, Sudan, Ethiopia, following her in submission. Daniel 11.40-43 Egypt is emphasized here because it is the main pillar upon which the Southern Alliance will be based. We may understand Libya to represent the entirety of North Africa, whereas Kush stands for East Africa. The northern, eastern and southeastern reaches of the South's three kingdoms, while not mentioned by name, fall into the category of the many lands of verse 41, so that here we see the fulfillment of the prophecy of the fall of the three horns. We should also recall in this respect that the three kings of these sub-kingdoms who were so instrumental in the beast's victory during the first campaign will certainly be exceptionally useful to him in his consolidation of power over their respective realms. Furthermore, the bandwagon effect of the astonishing defeat of this impressive army will not be lost on the rest of the world. It will serve to deflate the hopes of any and all who are even remotely considering opposition on the basis of secular means, especially when one considers the exponential increase in power that Antichrist will experience after capturing Egypt's treasures, namely all the natural resources of all of the Southern Alliance territories. The aftermath of defeat for Egypt, and by extension for all of the nations of the Triple Coalition that threw in with her under the Mahdi's leadership, is voluminously covered in Scripture, and the combination of passages which treat this subject paint a picture of abject defeat, a situation which will no doubt be all the more difficult to bear since the hopes of the South will have been thrown down from such a lofty height. Ezekiel 30 Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says the Lord, wail. Woe for the day! For a day of judgment is close, yes, the day of the Lord is close. It will be a day of clouds and time of judgment for the nations. For a sword will come against Egypt, and writhing will come upon Cush. When the slain fall in Egypt, they will take away her treasures and her foundations will be trampled. Cush and Put and Lydia, and all Arabia, Libya, and all the peoples in league with the land of Egypt, that is, all the allies of the king of the south, will fall by the sword. Ezekiel 32-5 Egypt's complete undoing at the hands of the beast will in the end be a benefit, for it will cause the Egyptians, along with many people of the lands of the south, to see the impotence of their modern-day Pharaoh, the Mahdi, and bring them instead to cry to the Lord for help, a prayer to be answered both at and after the return of our glorious Lord, Isaiah 19, 4-25. Ultimately, the South's defeat in this second decisive campaign will again be largely attributable to the treason of the Three Horns and the massive infighting that will ensue within her own ranks in the wake of the beast's springing of his trap. For I will spur on Egyptians against Egyptians, and they will fight one against his brother and another against his friend, a city against a city and a kingdom against a kingdom, that is, the splintering of the triple coalition. And Egypt's spirit will be emptied from the midst of her, for I will confound her plans, although they consult their idols and mediums and oracles and familiar spirits. And I will hand Egypt over into the hand of a cruel master, that is, Antichrist, even a stern king who will rule over them, says the Lord God of hosts. Isaiah 19.2-4 As was the case during the first campaign, so here too we may expect some complication of military maneuvers on account of the trumpet judgments, specifically for this second campaign, the sixth judgment, or second woe. The havoc wreaked upon the world by the bands of marauding demons is sure to affect this campaign at least to some degree. But, as was the case in the first campaign, we may expect 
that the worst-case analysis for the Army of the Beast would be an equal share of disruption, and it is fair to ask whether his forces would not be largely exempted from such an assault, for otherwise one would have, in effect, a case of Satan casting out Satan. Compare Matthew 12, 26. In any case, the result of the second campaign will be an overwhelming victory on the part of Antichrist, and the removal of the last major impediment to his worldwide rule, Ezekiel 31, 16 through 18. And the entire earth was in awe of the beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13, 3 and 4. The apparent assassination and resuscitation of Antichrist. Then he will be stricken as if dead, but will revive. Therefore he will be enraged at the Holy Covenant, so that on his return to Israel from the far south, he will take action against it, that is, eliminating Moses and Elijah and ending the sacrifices. Daniel 11.30 Immediately upon the heels of his dramatic victory over the south, the beast will be the object of an attempted assassination plot, the event that gives him the fatal wound that is nonetheless miraculously healed. Revelation 13.3 The key word in the half-verse quoted is the Hebrew verb form nisha. While there exists a variety of opinions among lexicographers and commentators about this difficult form, what we have here is most likely the nifal, that is, passive, perfect, of the verb cha'a, meaning to strike, smite, or scourge, hence the translation, he will be stricken. Time and space do not here permit a detailed explication. It must suffice to remark that in his Hebrew lexicon, Gesenius likewise derived this form from, and that he and other commentators, notably O. Zuckler and T. Lewis in the Langer series, also find the nifal of this verb at Job 38 in the form, that is, driven or scourged from the land. Gesenius understands the Dajesh forte as euphonic. Translations which take this verb as being used here in a strictly emotional sense, that is, understanding it to mean that Antichrist will be disheartened but not physically injured, do so without any firm evidence. The two passages often adduced as parallels, namely Psalm 109, 16 and Ezekiel 13, 22, both contain the delimiting word heart, which specifies the place affected or stricken, and thus move the application of the blow from the physical to the emotional realm. No similar delimiting word is to be found in Daniel 11.30. Therefore, given that the meaning of the near-identical root likewise means literally to strike or smite, and given the well-known Hebrew phenomenon of related roots often bearing identical meanings, the preponderance of evidence points in the direction of Antichrist being stricken in a quite literal sense, as opposed to suffering a mere psychological setback.